Hello friends, welcome to UGC EPG Patshala. Myself, Dr. Chandri Banerjee, serving as Assistant Professor at the Department of Geography, BSR Government Arts College, Alwar, Rajasthan. Today I shall speak on feminist geography, which is part of the paper, Geographical Thought. Now before I proceed, it is essential to know with which objectives I have forwarded or proceeded in this study. First and foremost, this is essential to understand the concept of feminism. Then, it is essential to know the meaning of the terms gender and patriarchy as these are intrinsically related to the concept of feminism. Thirdly, I shall try to trace the evolution of the feminist principle in the discipline of geography and then finally come to an understanding of the concept of ecofeminism which can be regarded as a manifestation of the feminist geography, feminist theory, sorry, in geography. It is very important to find answers to certain queries before going into a detailed discussion about feminist geography as the key concept of the discipline may be rooted in it. Several statistics across the globe pose certain questions before us as to why there are lesser number of females in certain parts of the globe as compared to males why the prevalence of illiteracy is more among females as compared to their male counterparts, why females in younger age groups tend to be more unemployed than their male counterparts, or why females are most often underrepresented in governments and politics. In short, whether in terms of birth, in terms of education, economy, or politics, opportunities and power are, power are unequal between the sexes. It is this inequality that forms a subject matter of what is known as feminism. The most important feature of feminism is that it challenges the traditional thinking by connecting issues of production with the issues of reproduction and the personal with the political. Now the feminist theory is essentially based on three assumptions. First and foremost, gender is a social construct that oppresses women more than men. These constructs are supposed to be shaped by what is called patriarchy. Women's knowledge about these constructs helps in envisioning a future non-sexist egalitarian society. There's two relevant concepts that needs to be understood here are that of gender and patriarchy. The word gender is often used interchangeably with sex, though the two have different, very different connotations altogether. While sex is biological, natural and remains constant over space and time, gender is supposed to be a social construct that may vary with time, space and culture. Gender is essentially a social classification of the sexes into masculine and feminine. Different masculine and feminine qualities may have their impact on the social and spatial relations between and among the sense sexes. When such relations are approached by geographers from within the realm of the principles and concepts of feminism, what arises may be termed as feminist geography. Now, since feminism always deals with women's position vis-a-vis -vis men, there may be another simultaneous field of study within geography, that is the geography of masculinities. And together, they constitute what can precisely be called a gender geography. The term patriarchy now is originally derived from the Old Testament, which is meant in simple words, which is meant the rule of the father. The word pater being derived from Latin, which means father. However, the feminist use of the term was introduced by Kate Miller in her groundbreaking book, Sexual Politics in 1970. The term may be well understood in the words of Marilyn French as the manifestation and institutionalization of male dominance over women and children in the family and the extension of this dominance in the society as a whole. 
The following aspects of women's life may be considered to be subject to patriarchal subjugation. First and foremost, it's women's productivity and labor power. Next, it's women's reproductive capacity and sexuality. Thirdly, it's women's mobility. Then it's women's access to the economic resources. And finally, it's the women's representation in the social, cultural and political institutions. Now to develop a proper understanding of the subject matter of feminist geography, it is necessary first to understand the true meaning of the feminist theory as its development through its time and the different schools of thought that emanated within it and how its methods can be used in geography. So before proceeding into the feminist theory in geography, it is essential to know what is basically the concept of feminism. Now, feminism as a concept is often misunderstood as an approach with extreme hatred for men and that it is conceived a feminist is essentially a female. But in reality, there is no biological prerequisite to be a feminist and in fact, even males can also be feminists. Just the way some women may not be feminists. The feminist theory upholds that inequality exists between the sexes. It has four notable features. First and foremost, it is intensely interdisciplinary in nature, ranging across the various disciplines. And it is not only true for feminist, feminist theory or feminism, but it is in fact the trend in most of the disciplines prevalent in modern times. Now certain themes are recurrent in it like reproduction, representation and sexual division of labor. Thirdly, it imbibes in it new concepts like sexism which are created not only to address the gaps in the existing knowledge about feminism but also to describe the forms of social discrimination. And finally, it draws upon women's subjective in experience to enrich knowledge so as to enable for her further betterment. The idea of women as a distinct social group dates back to the 18th century and in fact the first polit full political argument for women's rights and as individuals for furthering women's development was inspired by the French Revolution when Mary Wollstonecraft described in her a vindication of the rights of women that was published in 1792 as the psychological and economic damage experienced by women owing to their forced dependence on men and their exclusion from the public sphere. Over time, as is true for most of the disciplines or, or all the disciplines in fact, the ideology of feminism has passed through several modifications which can be termed as the waves or phases of feminism. These waves or phases have resulted in the development of its different variants. Now, the first wave of feminism started with the liberal principles of individual rights and freedom for women. The liberal feminists as they called themselves contrasted the concept of the servitude of women that was considered as natural and protested against all forms of subordination that reduced women to adjuncts of their male counterparts, namely their husbands or fathers. The roots of this stream of feminism can be traced in 17th century British liberalism and the French Revolution. Mary Wollstonecraft, the name I have already mentioned before, was considered to be a liberal feminist and she advocated for the protection of women under civil laws as well as their right to be politically represented and to be engaged in well-paid work and respected provisions. This was meant to reduce their dependence on the institution of marriage. Harriet Teller, another liberal feminist, argued that women should be allowed to work even after their marriage 
because this would enhance not only her economic contribution to the family and promote her status within it, but it would also improvise her freedom of choice. Domestic violence and the tyrannical behavior by the husbands was a central theme of focus for another liberal feminist named John Stuart Mill. Now, by the 1960s, though the first wave of liberal feminism had achieved its basic goals in Europe, women across the globe still suffered from various forms of legal discrimination and were grossly unequal in both economic as well as political terms. This paved the way for the second wave of feminism, which started in Europe towards the end of the 1960s. This wave or phase of feminism adopted a socialist and radical standpoint. Since 1970s, many feminists had started questioning the relevance of liberal, liberalism as a possible remedy to women's subjugation. And this is what gave rise to the radical viewpoints in feminism. Hence, the radical or the Marxist feminism emerged as a dominant strand of feminist ideology in the 1970s and the 1980s. This variant of feminism, as the name suggests, drew its ideas from the theories of Karl Marx, though Marx himself was not directly involved with the movement, with the feminist movement. This strand of feminism attempted to link the situation of women's oppression to class struggle and economic development. Though Marx himself did not have much to say, as I said earlier, regarding the situation of women, however, his methods and concepts were universally accepted and applied in the concept of feminism. Radical feminists argued that the key to comprehend the women's question is laid in the development of production, that is, economy and technology. Therefore, like any other social organization, the relationship between the sexes is a function of a particular stage of economic development and cannot be altered on its own, but only through socio-economic changes. These socio-economic changes were supposed to result from class conflict and revolution. Angels, who was a follower of Marx and believed in this strand of feminism, he, according to him, women's oppression did not exist through time, but only started with the creation of private property and a class-based society. Hence, only with the overthrow of capitalism, he assumed that such oppression would dis disappear and women would no longer then be economically dependent on men. In fact, the socialization of housework and childcare would free themselves from the domestic cores. Therefore, women instead of fighting for their own causes, as Angel asserted, should stand along with the working men for a revolutionary transformation of the society. This strand of feminism ruled out the idea that the interests of, of the working men and women might conflict, that women can have group interests beyond class lines or gender relations may have its own dynamics. By this time, another group of feminists were developing their theories asserting that patriarchy and not class was the oldest form of oppression. They constituted the radical feminists who originally worked within the Marxist setup in which they found that women's issues were treated as trivial. They were of the view that Marxism and feminism were not compatible with each other. However, in response to this, the true Marxist feminists rejected the concept of patriarchy as historical and they were of the opinion that women's issues could not be isolated from a wider socialist movement. They tried to analyze women's 
work both in home and in paid employment which eventually gave rise to the domestic labor debate and there was a demand of wages for housework. Now, some of the key ideas associated with radical feminism may be described as it was an, a mixture of both theory and practice. It linked the personal with the political and the fundamental nature of women's oppression with subordination. By the 1990s, there was a deep distrust for any meta-narratives or any universal philosophy as Marxists. This was the beginning of the post-modern era. Jean Fran Francois Lyotard, in, his po in her postmodern condition, laid the foundation for postmodern feminism, which believed that women like race, class, or ethnicity could not be used cross culturally to describe the practices of human societies and that it was a, not a universal category. And this is absolutely true because. The women, the situation of the women in the developing countries might be very different from the situation of the women in the developed blocks. Lyotard criticized the Marxist philosophy for propounding a homogeneous society which was believed to be created only through coercion. And in fact, it is not possible that society can be homogeneous. In fact, society is a very diverse concept. Even within a single society, we might find several heterogeneity. Now, the postmodern feminism upheld that social identities were heterogeneous and complex, as I'd already said, and it was thus impossible to create a totalizing social theory. Now, after having discussed the different the concept of feminism and the different strands it developed over time. We finally come to the evolution of feminist geography and how the concept of feminism was used in the geographical discourse. By the 1970s, it was increasingly felt that very little attention was being paid to the matter that whether the methods of mainstream research and theoretical approaches could be applied in the feminist studies. Prior to this, it was a widely held notion that women were not capable of political thinking or economic decision making. And even in academia, the discipline of geography was no exception to this. Hence, there was very little contribution in the field of feminist geography. It was realized that since there were very less women academicians in geography, women's issues were not sufficiently studied in it. So the preliminary objective was with which the feminist geography was developed was to make women visible in the field of geographical studies. And what followed was a series of articles that attempted to probe the position of and acknowledge the presence of women within geography. One of the pioneering works was The Strange Case of the Missing Female Geographer in, written by Wilbur Zelensky in 1973. Sorry. And in this uh, matter, I would like to say that, uh, as I have already said earlier, that it is not essential that only uh, women or only females can be true feminists. In fact, Wilbur Zelensky was considered as a pioneer in the field of feminist geography was himself a male. Drawing inspiration from the development of feminist theory in the social sciences and the welfare, radical and the Marxist streams of geography, soon there were works produced by members of several women's study groups and professional geographical associations in United States, Canada, and Britain. Of course, mention in this regard may be made of the Women and the Geography Study Group of the Institute of the British Geographers, who presented a series of researches on feminism and geography at the annual meeting of the 
IBG or the Institute of British Geographers in 1981. In 1983, they also organized a series of sessions and lectures on feminism as a mode of geographical thought and thereafter in 1984 published their landmark work Geography and Gender, an Introduction to Feminist Geography. In 1982, two feminist scholars, Janice Monk and Susan Hansen, collaborated to produce an outstanding article on not excluding half of the human in human geography. And this itself is self-explanatory about the work because half of the population, which was meant to be women, were not represented in the geographical in the field of geographical studies. Another collaborative work was produced by Mazze and Lee in Her Space, Her Place in 1983, which provided in fact one of the best introduction to this emerging branch of geography. Taking recourse to conventional geographical methods, feminist geographers tried to map the geography of women's rights status of abortion laws, economic and political participation of women, their differential access to education, income and health services, their daily travel patterns as well as long-term migration patterns. In 1984, two important works of feminist geography came forth in the United States. One was a PhD thesis written in the Department of Geography at the University of California in Berkeley that was entirely devoted on feminist or devoted to feminist geography and a special edition of the geography journal uh, Antipode was which was considered as a mouthpiece of the radical geographers was also published which dealt exclusively with feminist geography. Following their British and American counterparts a new specialized study group named the Canadian Women and Geography was created within the Canadian Association of Geographers in 1985. All these works greatly inspired the initiation of a multitude of a research on women's topics by feminist academics in geography like urban environment, housing, transportation, women in labor force, access to social services, violence, family structure, etc. By the 1980s, more advanced and theoretically sophisticated works began to be produced in this new field of geography, that is, the feminist geography. A celebrated article titled, A Women's Place by Doreen Massey and Linda McDowell may be cited as an example. McDowell also published another work titled Coming in from the Dark, the Feminist Research in Geography, which itself is explanatory about the position of the feminist studies in the recent past. That is, the feminist studies were very, very highly obscured in the geographical knowledge, in the field of geographical knowledge. Gradually, geographical studies were being discussed more and more in the feminist contexts. By this time, feminist geography was quite well established and in fact some feminist geographers wanted to extend the arena of this new domain of knowledge beyond the Anglo-American circuit to the developing world that included the countries of Africa, Asia and Latin America. As the 1990s approached, feminism in geography was strongly grounded. This fact can be substantiated by the fact of, uh, of the launching of a new and exclusive journal on feminism that was known by Gender, Place and Culture, a journal of feminist geography. This journal was launched in the year 1994 and this was totally devoted to issues of feminism, gender, sexuality and so on within the field of geographical knowledge. Three 
interrelated observations stimulated the growth of feminist geography. Firstly, it was a presumption that the spatial layout is essentially gendered. To elaborate this viewpoint, I may say that the terms private, home or suburbs were always associated with women in the public private or the work home or the city suburbs relations or the dichotomy. Second was, it was observed that it was the subculturally specific notions about gender behavior were greatly shaped by spatial relations. To elaborate on this, I may say that women's access to social services was largely determined by her location and associated with the gender roles. The third presumption that stimulated the growth of the feminist research in geography was that it, f it was found that often a person's relationship to the environment was largely a function of gender. To exemplify this point, I may say that the idea of a safe and unsafe en environment may be different for women and men. Now, after having discussed the concept of feminism and then like discussing how this concept was implemented in the field of geographical knowledge, I shall come to the next sub subsection that is the ecofeminism, which is considered to be a manifestation of the feminist theory in geography. As we all know that man-environment relationship has always been one of the prime themes of geography. Now this relationship has had have several shades over time. Sometimes it was humanity determined by the nature, sometimes it was humans as modifiers of nature and sometimes it was humans in harmony with nature. So far as the concept of ecofeminism is concerned, it may be viewed as a feminist perspective to the relationship between nature and humans or in short, it is the feminist perspective to environmentalism. During the time when feminist issues began to appear in the discipline of geography, a term called green politics was highly prevalent in the West which also assumed the character of mainstream politics with heightened concern for an ecologically balanced earth. That is, the main objective of this group of politicians was to strive for an ecologically balanced earth. Both the movements, that is environmentalism and feminism, found a common ground of subordination by man, that is humans in case of environmentalism and man in case of feminism. And these two movements, they joined hands to give birth to a new socio-political philosophy called ecofeminism. The original expression of the term was however ecological feminian that was coined by the French feminist Francois de Eubonne to express a strong parallel between the subjugation of women in family and the society as a whole and the degradation of nature. The term ecofeminism appeared for the first time in 1974 in the book titled Feminism or Death that was authored by Frank Hoyt Eubel. However, the term was popularized following the first ecofeminist conference that was held at Amherst in 1980 where a large number of women across USA came together to launch their protests against environmental destruction. The basic essence of this concept of ecofeminism as I need to explain is that it, is, it deals with the devalued status of women in society and the degradation of nature. And this devalued status of women in the society and the degradation of nature are considered by this philosophy as the two sides of the same coin. Nature is epitomized as feminine according to ecofeminism 
and the male ownership of land and other natural resources were considered to give rise to a dominator culture. Hence, ecofeminism used such terms as rape the land, tame nature and like. Warren has described this, the basic tenets of ecofeminism as women are considered akin to nature whereas men are considered closer to culture. Both women and nature are conceived as producers of life that is ideologically rooted in their reproductive powers. Thirdly, a strong parallel exists between the oppression and domination of women and the degradation and exploitation of nature. And understanding the connection between women and nature is a basic requirement to understand the oppression of women and the exploitation of nature. Hence, feminist theory and practice should have an ecological association and likewise environmental issues in turn should be approached with a feminist perspective. And because of the close link that exists between women and nature, women should be conceived or perceived rather as important stakeholders in environmental protection and conservation. And finally, there should be the establishment of an egalitarian society in which there is no dominance on women or nature by man. In the 1990s, by the time feminist geography was well established, two prominent works on ecofeminism was produced. One was by Irene Diamond and Glorin Orenstein in 1990, named Reweaving the World, the Emergence of Ecofeminism. This work laid out three strands of ecofeminism. First was the social justice which was supposed to be achieved in collaboration with the well-being of the earth since human life is dependent on this planet. Then it's a spiritual aspect which emphasized on the sacrosanct act earth and the third strand highlighted on the necessity of sustainability. Another important work that was co-authored by Vandana Shiva and Maria Mize in 1993 was titled Ecofeminism. And this work spoke of three kinds of domination, domination as prevalent in the existing world. First, it is, it is nature by humans. Secondly, it is women by men. And thirdly, it is the global south which means the developing nations by the global north that is the developed bloc especially in terms of access to natural resources and controlling the world economy. Shiva, that is Vandana Shiva, uh, asserted that one of the main motives of ecofeminism was to modify the outlook of the society regarding the activities and productivities of women and nature, both of whom are misconceived as passive and it is this misconception which leads to their exploitation. Mize described women's work as producing sustenance and advocated that women and nature worked as partners to give rise to a new kind of relationship in which there is an essence of reciprocity. It is fact that even women uses nature or serve nature, but then in that case there is no sense of domination. Rather, there is a sense of to let go and to make grow. Sometimes ecofeminism is also linked with the concept of deep ecology in that both the philosophies stand in contrast to male chauvinism and in fact both may be considered as forms of radical environmentalism. The term deep ecology was first introduced around the same time as the introduction of the concept of ecofeminism by the Norwegian philosopher Arne Nais in an article titled The Shallow and the Deep Long Range Ecology Movement. Now what was common between these two movements that were that was 
both were critical of any kind of hierarchy, be it nature humans, man women or nature culture and so forth. And both the philosophies sought to establish an egalitarian system that was free from any kind of domination, giving equal right to, to every living form to blossom and flourish. However, there was a basic difference between the two. While deep ecology was essentially against anthropocentrism, ecofeminism was against androcentrism. Deep ecologists considered human population as the root cause of any sort of biospherical destruction since humans multiply themselves selfishly at the cost of other forms of life causing their numbers to cross the carrying capacity of the earth. However, they failed to provide an answer to the question that is the deep ecologist as to why humans reproduce even in areas with huge population size that may lead to food shortages, overcrowding, poor health and hygiene, degradation of the land, destruction of the species, etc. For this, the ecofeminism found ecofeminists found their answers in a multitude of human social factors which were akin to the issues of gender and oppression. And these social factors were sexism, which meant the glorification of male virility uh, associated with the reproductive capacities, uh, which was often associated with the reproductive capacities and abundance of offsprings that with male prestige. Secondly, motherhood was considered as a universal phenomena for women and uh, women not producing children was considered a social taboo. Since certain cultural forms of birth control were forbidden and they were treated as signs of collusion and finally it was uh, seen that racism and class oppression often gives rise to uh, higher population in areas and that was evident in case of women uh, residing in developing uh, blocks where more number of children were considered as more earning hands. Now, uh, uh, Lib uh, Caroline Merchant has uh, described about different strands of ecofeminism. She has, like the feminist theory, ecofeminism had also uh, developed several strands or variants within it. First and foremost was liberal uh, ecofeminism that was similar to the liberal feminism we have seen, uh, we have discussed earlier. Then it is the cultural ecofeminism, then it is social ecofeminism and finally it is socialist ecofeminism. It is true that uh, ecofeminism uh, has given a new dimension to the uh, a new arena in the field of geographical studies. However, it has been subject to criticism as being too idealistic in its standpoint, since it is overemphasized the mystical connection between nature and women, rather than highlighting the actual conditions of women. Ecofeminism, uh, which is uh, uh, new in its content in the subject of geography, thus imbibes in it the essence of feminism and environmentalism in it. However, the concept has been criticized as being too idealist in its, in its standpoint uh, so far as it connects the relation of uh, oppression bet between women and nature rather than speaking on the true situation or the conditions of women. Nevertheless, it has given rise to a new ecological philosophy or an ecosophy in the subject matter of geography and thus has led and opened a new arena of study in the discourse, geographical discourse. Thank you.